We're going to have a very interesting and exciting day today and welcome everyone here to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Uh, welcome, welcome. I'm Stephen White, Chief Strategy Officer at COSI, Center of Science and Industry, your COSI, and I am also a proud member of the Board of Trustees here at CMC. I'm so pleased that all of you are here with us today on this snowy Wednesday. Thank you. Now, before we begin, we would also like to thank the Columbus State Community College and PNC for their sponsorship of today's forum. We would also like to thank Grange Insurance Audubon Center here uh, for their ongoing support. Thank you as well to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream. Let's give them a nice warm applause for their incredible support. Now, few events in US history have impacted education like the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has erased years of student progress. Recently, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, known as the nation's report card, revealed losses in educational attainment across our nation. The biggest drop in math scores ever reported. Reading scores fell to their lowest levels since 1992. Today's panel will explore the damage done by the pandemic to education and the ways that we can close the COVID learning gap across our community and across Central Ohio. And now to introduce our panel, please welcome Alan Kraus, today's sponsor, Columbus State Community College. Alan, the podium is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. As Stephen said, my name's Alan Kraus. I'm Vice President, Leading Marketing Communications and Enrollment Services at Columbus State. And uh, I'm honored to be here representing lots of Columbus State colleagues, many of whom are right here at this table, sharing uh, support and scrutiny like, in their eyes, I can see. Um, and, and as a college, we're, we're really delighted to be uh, able to lend support and sponsorship to, to this really timely and important conversation. Uh, while the college is a regular sponsor of CMC forums, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to introduce one. And uh, the very good advice that I was given was very simple, make the connection between the topic and your organization. And, uh, and don't be afraid to lend some levity or humor to your brief remarks. So we'll see how I do. The, fir that, the first part of that is easy. Um, you know, in this conversation today, we're gonna bring the kind of learning loss headlines to life. And, and Stephen set it up well. We're gonna be discussing decades worth of lost progress in math and reading among K-12 students. We'll discuss how this universally bad scenario has hit students of color and students from low-income families especially hard. And we're going to discuss how the students who could at least afford an academic setback fell furthest, making the big gap between high and low performers even bigger. So the students that we'll be discussing who are impacted by this are a match in many ways for the students at Columbus State. This past fall, among the 25,000, roughly 25 students, uh, 25,000 students who enrolled at the college, nearly 12,000 or 19 or younger, so have, are caught up in this. Um, roughly 40% are students of color. Big percentages of our students are financially and academically needy. And so the profile of pandemic-stricken students looks a lot like the profile of Columbus State students. So for us, the, the need for this conversation is clear. Um, the bad news is I could not find a way to round that corner with a funny take on the whole situation. And so, but the, the mic will be open later. If anybody has any good learning loss jokes, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have your opportunity. Um, there is good news though. Um, this is a sold out session. I'm told that has not happened every time, even in this environment. And I think that speaks to a collective understanding that um, we all have to be part of a solution here. I've seen a lot of great colleagues today from K-12 and higher ed environments who are, are here to help turn this around. A um, lot of employer partners who know that their future workforce talent pipeline depends on a solution to this problem. 
Um, we were introduced twice to uh, Mr. Mario Bassara. See, I, three people, and none of us could say your name right. Um, Mario Bassara, but <laughs> we're going to have to have you come up, I think. And, but, but, you know, like Future Ready, at which Mario is new CEO, there are a lot of collective impact organizations represented here also want to be part of the solution. So we have the right people here, and the stage is set for a great conversation. And I'm pleased now to introduce the speakers who are going to lead us through it, who are here. And I'm going to mess up some names here, too, in, in all likelihood. But the first one is easy. Um, nearest me is Amy Gordon, who is executive director and CEO of Communities in Schools of Ohio. In the middle is Dr. Stefan Lavertu, professor and director of doctoral studies with the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at Ohio State University. and then. Furthest from me is Cheryl Ward, Vice President, Success by Third Grade of the United Way of Central Ohio. So welcome to them, and also welcome to our host, who will lead the conversation, Dr. Eric uh, Karolak, who is CEO of Action for Children. Welcome, Eric, and all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Alan and uh, CMC, for uh, the invitation to host uh, today's community conversation. Um, uh, I'm honored to be with this esteemed panel of experts, and we're going to dive right in. I have to say, though, it, there's some fitting irony, maybe, that on a day when tens of thousands of school children, literally more than 50,000 school children in this county, are home from school because of a weather incident, we're going to unpack the exponentially greater disruption caused by the pandemic uh, that began in, uh, just shy of three years ago. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's also a, an important point of reference for us to recall that more than 1.1 million Americans have died because of COVID-19, 41,000 plus Ohioans. And that is a stark reality. It's not the only set of numbers you're going to hear, though, but that is, a, that is the upper-level background noise of, of this conversation. Things are much better than they were in uh, the dark days of 2020, where we've made so much progress. In, in fact, two out of three people in Franklin County, two out of three of you, roughly, are fully vaccinated. But we're not completely beyond this. We've got a ways to go. Um, the, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm confident in saying that 100% of us would like to be done with this. Unfortunately, as we look to ex reality, the experiences of students, we know that there have been some significant consequences for those children in our schools. And the impact of those, the length, the, 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 the extent to which that impact will last is, is really unknown. That's what we'll be unpacking today. So to begin, Professor Levertu, Stefan, uh, you and your team at the Columbus at OSU's uh, College of Glenn College of Public Affairs have explored this impact of the pandemic on school student learning over a series of analyses going back to 2020. Tell us a little bit about what you and your team found. Provide a level setting on this issue for all of us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and please cut me off if uh, I go too long, um, and I can answer more specific questions later. Uh, I think to understand what happened uh, during the pandemic and where we are now, it's best to think about what happened initially, March 2020 through the end of 2020. And if I uh, review that for you, I think you'll understand why we are where we are uh, right now. Um, and a lot of the things that happened in 2020 are things that before the pandemic, researchers would have told you there's credible evidence that this will have a devastating impact on student achievement. So let me just review some of those things first. Uh, first, we have remote instruction, uh, right? We had elementary and secondary schools shut down in March 2020. Uh, and even in fall of 2020, uh, the majority of districts at some point were remote or hybrid uh, in the fall of 2020. Uh, so that's one. Uh, two, we have a lot of household stress. So we have some non-school factors going on here. We had a stay-at-home order. We had a massive jump uh, in unemployment rates that we hadn't seen since the Depression. Uh, some people thought we were entering a depression. They're worried about their finances. And so now you've got stressed parents in homes with stressed kids. Uh, and just imagine what kind of toll that can take. Uh, and then we have political conflicts. 
Uh, with, believe it or not, we have good research showing that historically, re political conflicts at the district level, like on intelligent design here in Columbus, I remember that 20 years ago, uh, on race and all these sorts of things, we know affects student achievement in math and reading. It affects teachers, it affects uh, students. Well, the political conflict started with masks, and that seeped into the classroom, and then vaccination, and then reopening, and now it's critical race theory. It hasn't stopped, it's a pressure cooker. So we've got schools, we've got things outside of schools coming together, and um, I saw Paolo Di Maria here uh, earlier. Um, over Christmas break in December 2020, he said, fine, this is an emergency, let's just give you whatever preliminary data we have from the reading assessments this past October, November, uh, and let's see what's going on here. My colleague, Vlad Kogan, also a professor of political science at OSU, and I, uh, that's what we did during our, our winter break uh, in 2020, and we expected to see the worst, and that's what we got. Uh, this is just reading, this is third grade reading at this point, and we saw that uh, on average, students in Ohio had lost about one third of a year's worth of learning. We saw that it was unequal. There were 10% of districts that lost nothing. On average, their students were doing just like they were before the pandemic. The bottom 10% of districts in terms of achievement had lost two thirds of a year's worth of learning. What I'm saying is it's like they never went to school. They never learned a darn thing between March and November. Um, and we know that disproportionately those students are uh, low income, black, or Hispanic, right? And they're in districts where that happened. We also looked for causes. We found that about a third of this could be explained by remote instruction. We found that about a third of this actually could be per explained statistically, not necessarily causally, by the jump in unemployment rates in certain communities. So there's this stress factor outside of school that's operating here. So that's the initial uh, dig, right? We have widening achievement gaps, lower achievement for everybody, and then we did a series of subsequent analyses. What did we find? We found the impacts are much worse in math. We found that uh, for the rest of 2020-21 school year, the decline kept going. We found that in the 2021-22 school year, there was some recovery, but not nearly enough to get us back to where uh, we were. We're basically today exactly where we were in December 2020 after that first report. Um, wider achievement gaps, much lower achievement. Uh, so as uh, Alan and Eric uh, mentioned, we have record losses in achievement. Why do we care about this? Well, we care because they're highly predictive. Achievement tests like reading and math are highly predictive of students' incomes, uh, their criminality later in life, uh, whether there's teenage pregnancy, Economic growth in Ohio, it affects everybody in Ohio and the United States. That said, I also want to impress upon you that it's not just achievement tests. Above and beyond achievement tests, what predicts lifetime success in terms of indicators we track in schools? Things like attendance and disciplinary incidents. Record levels of chronic absenteeism. It doubled from 16% to 30% in Ohio. That means that those students are missing over 10% of instructional hours. Um, in Columbus City Schools, we're above 70% chronic absenteeism, I think, in 2022. That's incredible, that's incredible. And again, don't, remember, don't forget, kids coming into school are not the same. We see neuroscientists are finding that their brains have aged differently, um, that they show more aging in areas of the brain associated with anxiety, and they come in with less voc vocabulary skills. Uh, so those initial, that initial dip, it looks like we're back on track to learning as we did before, roughly, but we haven't closed those gaps uh, from 2020. Wow, sobering. Ms. Ward, Cheryl, you were with a school district in 2020, and uh, you saw it from the inside, and, and Ms. Gordon, Amy, uh, you and your organization have stayed with schools as they shut down, uh, as they reopened. Um, tell us something about the experience on the ground that uh, Stefan gave us the overlay to. What was the human experience of, of that time period? Um, I'll start. Eric, thank you. Um, I remember that day very vividly. We were in a team meeting, and we started getting text that Governor DeWine was going to issue an order to uh, close schools. And immediately, the essence in the room was what is getting ready to happen? Where, what, what, is, what is happening? There was nowhere to put 
what we were getting ready to do. And now in the meantime, and some of you all, as we're talking, may have uh, memories of this time, because simultaneously to our role in education, people were on their way to the grocery store to buy out whatever it was to be able to prepare for whatever we were getting ready to go through, then nobody had an idea of what was getting ready to happen. But what I remember very distinctly is in our district, we had amazing district leaders who came together in a large room trying to figure out how we were going to pivot, what, pivoted, what pivoting might look like, in the meantime, not being sure. So coming together with everyone, having conversations, trying to draw plans, bringing back together, trying to figure out what, was going to, what did it mean, how were we going to make this communication to the parents, what did that look like. You have parents, you have teachers, you have people who are giving their all and trying to figure out how to support students, and they are also simultaneously dealing with their own students in their own household, and what is this going to look like, and how is this going to affect um, and putting our best foot forward to create online resources, to create social emotional supports, linking with our community providers, uh, with all of our district, bringing them to the table to say, what can you do? How can you help? How do we organize this and package this in a way that's going to at least make half of a sense in the process? And then I remember seeing us kind of coming together and really building a plane as we were trying to figure out what was happening and what was going on, um, having a release, we then had to be to home. And then the next part of that conversation was as we were returning. And Stefan, you bring up a wonderful point about masks and the, and the what, mask policies and what did that look like and b districts having to make a decision around do we stay remote? Do we do blended? How do we figure out blended? If kids are going in two days, and if they're home three days, how do the teachers, how are administrators, how are people going to manage this work? And then you have parents who are trying to figure out, well, if my child has to stay home and I still have to go to work, exactly how does that function? And then you have grandparents or you have neighbors if, if, if people are in a position to be able to have those external resources. And I think that speaks to the disparity part, where in our lives and in that situation, there were some of us who were able to tap into resources to help keep things moving. But we have some families who didn't have that level of resource, and they had to figure out the best way they could to be able to survive and trying to make the best decisions they could with the best resources that they had available to them. I think Cheryl really touches on um, the heart of the work of communities and schools. We're part of a national organization that serves high needs, high poverty, typically Title I schools. And so, as you can imagine, um, an organization called Communities in Schools did garner a few questions when you're not in the school. What will you be doing? Are you still relevant? And I have to give a shout out to my team, many of whom are here, of um, site coordinators, of program managers. Our work is having someone in the school all day, every day. But quickly, we had to figure out and that work is to reduce non-academic barriers. And so certainly we had to figure out in the pandemic for students who were now at home, many of whom only receive a meal when they're at school, that's the only food they're getting, uh, many of whom do not have at times electricity, let alone have the resources in terms of technology, hotspots, any of that to be able to do online school. So while our schools did an amazing job, our leaders and our educators did an amazing job of looking at how do we pivot uh, from an academic standpoint, we were continue, continuing to be challenged to look at how do we address an increase now in non-academic barriers? How do we make sure that children have food while they're at home? How do we make sure that uh, families that don't have access to technology or maybe who have a mobile hotspot can access that? I, I often, I began to make the analogy and often referenced, if you have someone drop a box of a million dollars off at your home on your front porch, that's fantastic. But if you can't open that box, if you don't know how to access that resource, it does you absolutely no good. And so what, what 
was critical to us was looking at how do we make sure that now that our kids are at home, where for many of them home is not always the safest or most comfortable space, how do we make sure that we can reduce and remove barriers so that they still can engage academically? Because many of the students that we work with, many of the marginalized students that we've talked about are not ones that have any luxury of losing any academic gains. And yet we've seen that and we're looking at how do we continue to address that by removing the things that are out of their control. Thanks. You know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really presented something like the largest live experiment in remote learning one could imagine. And, and I think even for those of you in the audience who may not be connected to schools, may work in just private places of employment, there's been a challenge too in terms of how you went maybe remote, how you've returned in a hybrid fashion, and how technology plays into that. I'm, I'm curious, how well did schools as places of employment and as customer serving organizations, think of students and education, how did they do with remote learning as a, as a, a practice and, and what was learned? I remember very distinctly um, teachers and administrators and principals having to figure out how to do remote learning. And at that point, we were in this kind of traditional, you go to school in the physical, you go to work in the physical, and now all of a sudden we have this opportunity that opens up remote. I, rem I remember we went through several renditions of a WebEx and Zoom and, and all those companies who now all of a sudden who were trying to sell products in a different way, had a plethora of people trying to access them, and it changed the landscape. Simultaneously, you have people doing crash courses, and how do you do remote? How, how in the world am I supposed to get 16 young people in kindergarten or first grade on the Zoom call to manage them, and what does that look like? Does that look like my traditional time? Do we have 20 minutes? And I remember this as a parent, because I have a 16-year-old thinking, how much time are you going to be on the computer? What is this going to look like? How is this folding out? And so I honestly think that for what was given, uh, districts tried to pivot as best they could. I do think it showed a gap in our ability to stay current with how we are educating. What are the tools that are available? And for us, you know, when you're, when you're an educator, oftentimes you're used to what you're doing. And so to be exposed to something new is not always one that you take graciously. But the situation created, a, it created the crash course, right? So it was, it was we gotta do this. But the beauty in how people really try to dig in and do this and figure it out. And so I do think moving forward, there are some lessons learned in this process and some pretty amazing opportunities because I can ask everyone in this room, how many of you all still Zoom, WebEx, Teams? And now it is probably the more prevalent mode of process. And so sometimes these crises create the opportunity for us to rethink and to level set how we are functioning and how we are moving, and quite honestly, revisit lessons learned. Do I think in districts, certainly in the district that I, I, I came from, there were lessons learned. And I think that a part of growth and a part of leadership is to be honest about the lessons learned, to not allow them to intimidate us, but to come to the table and have some honest conversation about how did it work, where are the opportunities for growth, and how do we teach that, because in education, our job is to create young people who can know how to handle the world, adjust in a crisis, figure out what we need to do to make it better, and then advance. And so we have a responsibility to model that process. Yeah, yeah I'm curious, um, all those kids right now today who are at home, how many of them are actually engaging in remote education? Because if, can you raise your hand if you have a child who stayed home from school today who's actually learning anything? Oh. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, part of success in life, in my, my philosophy, is that you have to make the layups. And, today, you know, a test of whether we learned anything 
Today's a test, right? And we missed this layup, I, is my view. Um, and my other concern about remote instruction is that even if you do it perfectly, everyone's got a computer, everyone's got a quiet room to work in, uh, and uh, all, all that stuff. We still know from higher education where you have kids at Northwestern University uh, who are decided to take remote classes from their dorm, uh, that there's some kids that'll do just fine or some young adults that will do just fine, but there's some people who will not. Even when, everyone, when it's designed well and everyone has everything that they need to do it, you still will have an expansion of gaps. Kids need time management skills. They need support at home. This is what we call co-production in public affairs. Education is not just the teacher on one end, right? Um, so I'm very suspicious. I know I love that I can Zoom. I, I love that we have this technology. Maybe it'll help people be more organized in districts to use some of these platforms. Um, it helps me at OSU. Uh, but let's not forget the fundamentals here. If you have a kid in your classroom, they're there. You're engaging with them. You're picking up all sorts of signals. That's how you ensure that learning gaps don't expand. That's my opinion. And I think just to follow up on that, again, we talk about when our children are at home and whether you know, they're engaged in remote learning and whether they're learning when they're online. Um, you know, again, and my, my passion and my heart are, are for the kids that don't have many of those opportunities or don't have that luxury of a quiet room or being somewhere that is a safe space for them. And I, I recall a story not too long ago of a second grader um, who was on Zoom, was in a Zoom classroom, and said to the teacher, you know, I, I have to go, I have to get my baby brother. And now second grade, seven-year-old. And the teacher said, well, that's okay, your mom can get him. And he said, no, I have to go, I have to go get my baby brother. And, and the teacher said, well, can't your mom? And he said, my mom's at work. I'm the only one here. And that's a second grader on Zoom. How do you, you know, how do we expect, how do you expect a, a child to be able to focus on learning and be able to be engaged in their owning their own learning process when they are dealing with, with adult problems in the world? And so, you know, again, I, I look at the learning loss that has existed. I was listening to an NPR um, podcast recently, and they were talking about the difference in some of our, um, basically the higher need schools, higher poverty schools, lost about 22 total weeks of anything in class. Whereas, um, by comparison, our better resourced or our higher um, you know, income areas, a lot of those students were about 13 weeks, and some of them many less than that. And just you know, as Stefan referred to, the gap and the difference in that learning loss was really critical among our, our students who are facing a lot of barriers that go beyond what they're um, facing in the classroom or what they're facing in having the learning loss. And to take that, I think you know, the critical conversation with that is looking at how do we address and, and begin to reduce those barriers now. And certainly in the pandemic, one of the other really, I think, large benefits were the number of organizations, the number of businesses, teachers, schools, administrators that came together to work collaboratively. And I think that a lot of silos that existed began to break down during that time, which was really critical, because the needs are great no matter where you are. I had a daughter who um, was a junior in 2020 and graduated in 21, so she missed the large majority of her time. And I looked at her, you know, stable family, plenty of food, plenty of resources, but she really struggled with, with depression at times. I mean, it was, the mental health impact on our students was huge. And so I think that while we need to look critically at the learning loss and how we mitigate that and how we continue to support them, we have to continue to look at how we collaborate, how we come together, how we work in tandem to address all of the areas that impact our children, from mental health to basic resources to security to all of those different pieces, and make sure that as we're moving forward in a time where we're wanting to make up learning loss and we're needing to catch up, that we are still looking comprehensively at the whole child and all the things that impact them on a daily basis. That's a, a perfect segue. You know, it's so uh, tempting to go into uh, analysis paralysis and just go deeper into the details of, of what the problem looks like, uh, the understanding the supportive services that schools provide on top of schools being a place for learning, uh, reading and math and so on. But um, let, let's turn, as you're suggesting, to, to looking ahead. 
what can we do in terms of making change? Um, Cheryl, the United Way has recently launched this new bold initiative, Success by Third Grade. Is the timing of that at all connected to the pandemic? Would it have happened anyhow? And how does the work of the initiative relate to the situation schools and students find themselves in? Certainly. So the United West Central Ohio began this process of taking a look at disparities. And a part of our vision and our mission as an organization is to be able to look at the community and be able to identify where are opportunities to be able to address so that every young person has the right to believe in possibilities. And in that right includes basic needs and includes student success. And so in uh, the wisdom of our CEO and our board, as we began to take a look at a shift of how are we addressing the needs in the community, we look to what we call collective impact. And this idea of collective impact and a collective impact model is being able to identify a shared vision of how we are going to tackle and work together to create change. And so success by third grade is really a movement that centers around every young person in, in grades K through three has the opportunity to be on a pathway to success. And that pathway we identify in three areas and we work together with coalitions of school districts who accepted our invitation to join in the work. And in that is a recognition of child well-being feeling safe and supported, and home and family stability. And if we are collectively working together, leveraging the resources that we have in this community, and aligning ourselves saying we are all going to be committed, that every young person, grades K through three, has the opportunity to be successful, how do you bring your expertise to the table, how are we leveraging, and how are we recognizing that we all have skin in this game? As uh, Amy and Stefan were talking, there were a couple of words that came to mind that I think is reflective of the United Way, and that is the word of us and together. The pandemic created a situation where there is not an other. You know, sometimes we hear information, we listen to the news, and we go other, right? That, that, that is affecting somebody else. But I would imagine if we took a poll, you all are connected in some kind of way around COVID-19 around education, around the impact of those who have access and those who don't have access, and utilize your resources to be able to do that. And so in our work, we are working with seven school districts currently to be able to create systems and infrastructures that maximize what they have, but that bring the right people to the table in the community and be able to work with and to be able to remove barriers. Because at the end of the day, Every young person ought to have a right to dream of whatever possibilities that they want to have without having to wonder if it's possible, do I have access? And I think that is a charge for us as a community, that when we are working and putting ourselves in position to be better, that we understand the only better we can be is if we're helping somebody else become that better. Giving somebody else the opportunity to recognize it can be done. There are things to put in place. There are disparities. Certainly, we need to take a look at. There are dynamics in our community that we really have to make some true decisions to deal with, to wrestle with, and to make happen. We'll be turning to questions from the audience uh, shortly, both in-person attendees uh, in just a few minutes and, and those who are watching live on, uh, through the live stream. If you're here in the room, please make your way to the microphone at the back. Um, if you're watching online, the chat feature is really being monitored. Um, please uh, note your question there. But before we take questions from the audience, um, we want to offer the panel one last question. And so if you would uh, imagine you are in a room full of community leaders. You are in a room full of community leaders. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, um, it, imagine you are in a room full of elected officials the state legislatures here this morning, or uh, the school board, uh, the county commissioners, city council, and so forth. If you have a room full of elected officials, what do you want them to know about this issue, about what needs to be done? From a researcher perspective, 
I think it's really important for everybody to understand that the magnitude of the declines that we've seen, there are very few educational interventions that have ever been shown to recover that amount of learning loss quickly. Um, and the few that have, um, we should be skeptical that we can scale them up quickly because one of the things that we found in education is that we have success in these small experiments and then you scale it up and it fails. What happens? Um, the people delivering it change. It doesn't stay the same intervention. Well, the one intervention that people had a lot of faith in or hope in um, that could help us recover from this, the, the one hope, it seemed, was tutoring. Intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We know that can work. But what we've done uh, with the money that we've gotten for tutoring is we've created programs that are not exactly one-on-one, -on -one, that are virtual, we just talked about this, um, and that are opt-in. When you make things opt-in, virtual, and then you're replicating the exact situation that's gotten us here, right? And so I understand the, the need for tutoring. I understand wanting to get this all done quickly, but it took 30 years. You mentioned, I think, Stephen. It took 30 years to make those gains uh, that he talked about in English language arts on the NAEP uh, test. 30 years. Um, that's doing the little things. That's incrementally just doing it right. We know that we, instructional hours is when people learn things. Um, days like today, don't lose them. <laughs> uh, make sure that we don't have 70% chronic absenteeism rates. And I know it's not up to teachers whether their st students show up. They're part of the equation, maybe because they make things fun or they connect with the students. But folks like uh, Amy and Cheryl can do things in the community that will help make sure kids get to school. Make the layups, stay the course, focus on the basics, and eventually you'll get there. But when you're trying to spend $450 million in relief money like Columbus City Schools is uh, in three years, you can't, look, we gotta moderate our expectations a little bit, even though there's a lot of pressure to, to get everything back uh, right away. So I'd like to make a distinction between what I would say to a room full of legislators and what I'm thinking I might say. <laughs> What I would like to say would be stop placing blame, stop pointing the finger and start looking at the solutions. Start looking at how we as a community can come together. Again, our organization is Communities and Schools because our mission is to surround students with a community of support. There is no one person, there is no one teacher, no one district, superintendent, there is not any one entity that is going to solve this issue with our students that's gonna be the magic answer for how do we address learning loss? How do we remove barriers? It takes us working together. It takes the community coming into the school. It takes the conversations. It takes the collective impact work. You know, we are uh, um, uh, proud, um, proudly supported by United Way. We work collectively with many organizations that are represented in this room, many businesses. But our children need people that are looking for solutions and working together and looking to remove barriers, not add barriers, not add our own agendas or our own challenges to the problems or the challenges that they're facing. And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, it really is a matter of how do we lock arms? How do we look at our community, whether locally, statewide, all of that, and find ways that we can have the funding, have the resources, have the human connection, and make it about the kids, and make it about reducing and removing many of the things that are out of their control so that they can stay in school, they can come to school, stay in school, and be successful academically. And if I can add to, the, uh, to Stefan and Amy, one of the things is a recognition, and Stefan, you hit on this, and that's time. Oftentimes, as business leaders, there's an issue and there's a challenge, and there are statistics have, that have shown what it takes over time. And we have this dance that we do that says, we understand it has to take time, but I need to see gains by the end of the school year. <laughs> And, and the amount of stress that that puts on a school system, a school district, community partners, and then what happens is what Amy said, then the focus shifts from figuring out the right thing to do to getting an output before the end of the year. 
And so we wonder why we keep in this cycle on this hamster wheel is because we've got a responsibility to make a decision. We didn't get here overnight. And we've got amazing organizations in Franklin County and Columbus who are diligently working. We have to begin to sit back into the ego conversation. We all, we all have outcomes. We all have agendas. We all have mission statements. We all have all of that that govern what we do. But what I would say is, how do we get behind one shared vision? And for, for United Way, it is around how are we ensuring that our young people from K through three are successful, that we create this pathway because then, and we haven't, we haven't really even talked about our early childhood. We didn't get to Just that. Wait. And so a part of that is recognizing, even in our counterparts, Celebrate One, Future Ready, Action for Children, that we are coming together to say, how do we create the continuum? And how do we have conversations with the people who are doing the work? Because we also do that at times. We, we get in the group and we come up with ideas and then we go to the districts and they go, I'm sorry, that is not going to work for us. And then we paint the district sometimes as not being cooperative. But we didn't learn the shared part. You can come to a table with your own identity and who you are as an, as an organization and still play together. We can do that. We have to practice that muscle a little bit more if we want to work collectively with recognizing all the social determinants of health that are affecting our young people, all the dynamics and disparities that occur within our city. Roll up our sleeves and let's figure out that and let's reconnect to our own humanity because we have it. We are a wonderful city. We are a wonderful state. Let's show. Awesome. Um, come together. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's CMC's long-standing tradition to take audience questions. The divine Miss Mantra Moody is at the uh, mic in the back. If you would, in the room, make your way to her to uh, ask questions. She's also curating questions from the live stream. So if you're watching live, use the chat to raise a question. For those of you in person, I already said that. Go to the back of the mic. Um, Mantra, oh, oh uh, and out of respect for everyone and our limited time, please keep your questions brief and remember that questions end with a question mark. Um, <laughs> Mantra, what's the first question? And thank you everyone for being here again. All right, our first question is from Ariel Scott from Action for Children. Is she here? Did someone, okay, all right, I was just making sure. Um, what role can summer day camp programs play in working towards closing the achievement gap? What advice would you give to programs who want to collaborate with their local school system to help track learning outcomes? I'll jump into that one, and I'll let Stefan hit it too. Just because of the work that we're doing with United Way, uh, we are in seven school districts um, right now, and so one of the things, quite honestly, that we are working on and recognizing is how do we take what is already existing and make it better? So for example, individuals in the room who have summer day programs over the summer, how do we utilize our leverage even as United Way to bring the right people to the table? So school districts that are representative of your summer programs, let's get to the table and have a conversation. What do you need? Is there, are there curriculum? Are there certain things not that your day program has to have teachers? But are there things that we can align so that in your summer program, you are actually having those teaching one-on-one, -on -one, in-person, engaged experiences that students can have that are aligned to what they're gonna see when they go back in the fall. And then let's begin to have some shared, agree upon some shared measures that we can share across time so that the districts know what students are in your summer programs, the summer programs know what students are in the district, and let's begin to see, did these interventions work? And are we tracking them over time, and how can we be explicit? And so I think a part of that is really beginning to take a look at what's in your community and how can we come together, and certainly the United Way uh, wants to be a support and a partner in that process. And I was just going to say uh, a point of optimism with the research. When I told you there were gains, we saw some recovery in 21-22 here in Ohio. Uh, we have suggestive evidence that it actually happened over the summer. Um, and so again, just like today is a great day to you know, make some ground, um, summers are also um, 
a good time to do that as long as the programming's right. And we actually have some evidence that that's helped us out here uh, in Ohio in 21, 22. And I would also just um, add to that, one of my favorite sayings is that every child is one caring adult away from success. And I believe that's really true. And I think oftentimes we think we have to have you know, all the credentials, we have to have the perfect uh, program in place, everything has to be just right. And while that is extremely important to have that, particularly in a summer day camp or after school setting or any of those, it is also very important who you have in place, that you have someone that is caring, that is committed, that is consistent in a young person's life, and making sure that that person is, um, is aware of the impact that they can have. You can have the best curriculum, you can have the best, you know, summer program, you can have the the best of everything um, in terms of what is aesthetically pleasing or what is around a student in terms of activities, but if they don't feel safe or welcome or cared about or, an enga or engaged with an adult who is there, the impact is going to be much, uh, much less than it could be when they have someone that they're engaged with. Hi, Cindy Foley, Columbus Museum of Art. So one of the things I haven't heard you talk about quite yet are teachers. And in particular, I think one of the things we're seeing with the teachers that we work with is they're deeply concerned about the learning loss, but they're also deeply concerned that that now is a push again back to testing and what that, that rigidity can look like in the classroom. And what they talk to us about is their concern about the curiosity loss, not just the learning loss. How do we, and that I think for many of them who are struggling after all this time, what does joy in teaching look like? And so I guess I'd love to have you address how do we help with that part of the work, the curiosity, the wonder, creativity, that help with not only learning, but mental health and a range of issues. So I'll jump in, and then I'll let <laughs> colleagues jump in. And I think it goes back to we live in a society where we are all well-intentioned. And so, you know, testing has its place. There's perspectives on both sides of that and how much and standardized and what does it really measure and what does that really look like. Um, there are some, I call them is's in our world, right? Right now, there are some uh, requirements around testing and standardized testing and what does it look like. I also recognize and believe that a test does not fully uh, evaluate or honor who we are as individuals. Having said that, a part of the conversation is the us and us together, is to really begin to have a deep conversation about where are we trying to go and what is the purpose of the test? Because we can, we can get caught up in the standardized test and what we need, and I don't know if any of us stop to say, what are we measuring and, and why? And what does that look like? And let's just answer that question so that we put that in its proper place and we still recognize how we are shaping and embodying the whole of a person. Because we are a whole person. And how do we do that? And how do we have those conversations about engaging in the experimentations in the world and what life looks like? And I think to the point with teachers about that joy and balancing out the expectation of standardized tests, but not allowing that to overshadow how we develop young people who have to learn how to manage and navigate in the world um, that is not always about a test. Uh, I, I feel like I need to say something about testing. We've been talking about test scores quite a bit. Um, I think it's important to remember, uh, first of all, I agree with everything that's been said. Of course, you want to put tests in their proper context, and um, you want to make sure learning is fun, and you develop these other dimensions that are important for human beings that we catch in other measures like attendance and discipline and things like that. Um, and there is good experimental evidence that trips to the museum can dramatically improve student learning. But I want everybody to remember that before No Child Left Behind, the argument for having annual standardized tests was a civil rights argument. If you don't know how everyone is doing, you don't know whom to help. And we did have these conversations, and I worked at ODE in 2000 when we first rolled out academic standards. We had community conversations with educators, uh, folks like you, to figure out what should be in each of the exams and what, and, and what do people need to know to function as human beings. Um, and, and so there's been a lot of thought put into that. And this is why we have to be concerned when the test scores are down. That's why we cannot stop testing. 
please don't stop testing. But I do agree that we want conversations because uh, yes, we want everyone reading by the end of third grade. You, you've, you've just ruined someone's life if you don't teach them how to read by the end of third grade, right? You're ruining people's lives, literally. But not everybody needs to go to college, and not a four-year college. Not everybody needs to do the same thing. And we definitely have to have conversations about those sorts of things and about how much accountability to attach to tests. So I agree, we, there's, there's places for everything, but I, I just get so worried when I hear no, we need to get rid of some of this testing. Please do not. Please talk to me first. Let's. <laughs> Go ahead. How you doing? My name is Montez Mickens. I own MJ Photography and Videography, but I'm not here as a business owner today. I'm here as a father. So my question is very simple. So if something hits us like COVID hits us again today, what will we do different this time? Because my family really suffered during that time, so. That's a great question. I, I remember a colleague saying, you know, I don't have it all together for this, this first pandemic, but boy, when the next one comes around, I'll know what to expect. <laughs> Um, and I'm not sure necessarily that there, there is a clear answer. I mean, we, we know obviously a lot more now. We know, you know what needs to be done differently and, and what could be done differently. But I think, again, it's, there's just not a, a clear answer on that beyond making sure that the resources and the planning exist to the extent that they can. I mean, there were, there were things with, um, you know, to the point of students being at home and not having access to technology. I mean, I think now most districts have made sure that all students have technology in their hands, but we still need to make sure that it doesn't just end there. How do we do a better job of looking at supporting our teachers in that? You know, back to the question about the teachers, we've got to be able to support our teachers as well, their mental health and their well-being, because how do we expect them to show up and help our students if we're not understanding and supporting them in this process as well? So, boy, I, I'm quite sure that I would uh, be very wealthy if I had a, a clear-cut answer on how it would be different that it wouldn't be at the level that it was. And certainly we have learned and there's things to be done, but I think these conversations, collaboration, communication, clear communication to families, having resources and the openness and the opportunity to know where to go for the help and for the support from a school district level, from an outside resource level, is, would hopefully be something that would help reduce some of that, that immediate impact. We wish we had more time. There's so much more to explore, but we have to turn it back over now to Stephen White for concluding remarks. Wow. Well, um, well, I hope you found uh, today's forum insightful. I know I did. And you know, as we look back, we know now from the data that this educational gap is real. This, this COVID canyon is real. And that's particularly hitting our underserved population, our youth, children of color, children that are marginalized. But what I also heard today is that as we look forward, as we look forward to close that gap, we should do so by looking holistically at the child at home. How can we support that parent at school? How can we support those educators and those facilitators? And also in the community, each of us has a role in this idea of collective impact, the model that we can all work on this together and that it will not happen overnight, but rather over time, we can make it happen. So as you leave here today, I challenge each and every one of us from what we've heard, ask yourself, what are you doing? What are you doing to support our children and to support our community overcome this COVID canyon through the lens and the power of partnerships? So thank you. For today's forum speakers, uh, Columbus State Community College and PNC. Thank you as well to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for its support. Thank you to our virtual seat patrons and to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation. 
and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream, and a special appreciation today to um, our speakers, Amy Gordon, Stefan Labertu, Cheryl Roard, and our hosts, Eric, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. And I also want to acknowledge we've got some special guests here today. We've got students here today from Otterbein and CCAD. So they're going to be attending here our CMC uh, this winter semester. So please take a moment before you leave here, each of you, to introduce yourselves. And let's all welcome them uh, with, uh, with open arms. And so please make plans now. If you thought today's conversation was insightful, uh, please check out our forums here next week. Uh, we were going to be welcoming the former Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor in a conversation led by former Justice Yvette McGee Brown. And lastly, our thanks to each and every one of you. Uh, we could not do this without you. And uh, we thank you so much for all that you do for CMC and for our community. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.